First off, I'd like to welcome everyone and thank you for joining us this afternoon. My name is Erin Zion and I'm the Marketing Coordinator for Ideal Computer Systems. And I'm pleased to introduce our guest panelists for today's webinar. First up, we have Bob Clements, President of Bob Clements International. Bob and his team specialize in helping dealerships implement best practices for improving profitability and efficiency. Next, we have Jeff Nicholson, owner of P&P Small Engines in Des Moines, Iowa. Jeff and his wife, Tanya, own and operate a successful OPE business and have recently worked with Bob to implement some new best practices into their business. And last but not least, we have Dave Baumgarten, lead, tra lead trainer for Ideal Computer Systems. Dave has spent the last 20 years visiting dealerships throughout North America and has trained hundreds of dealers on how to use the dealer management software and make it work for their business. Okay, we have a lot of great material to cover today, so let me start by asking Jeff, what is the biggest opportunity you have found to take advantage of over the last couple of years? Well, I would say that uh, a lot of our competitors have gone out of, out of the business. Uh, we most recently lost one within about three miles from us on the same street here, same busy street. Um, and we picked up a lot of business from that. And along with that happening, we found a couple new lines of equipment that we added that instantly brought some more customers to us. Um, we picked up Husqvarna and we picked up Country Clipper. And those two lines have, have instantly brought extra customers through the doors and gave us uh, a little wider range of product to sell. Um, and our business is showing, you know, just because of it, because of that, our sales are growing and a lot of it is due to the new customers that we're getting through. Okay. Bob, what opportunities are you seeing other, seeing other dealers taking advantage of? Well, I, I think, uh, Aaron, going back to what Jeff was talking about, you know, there is a uh, uh, a decrease in dealers uh, in, in all in all types of markets, not just in outdoor power, but in power sports and RV and and in marine and uh, ag and construction. And so, uh, there's there's opportunities for dealers out there to grab that. There's kind of a vacuum, uh, like Jeff found out when the dealer down the road from him closed up. So there's this opportunity that, that's there. People are looking. Uh, so I think that's the big one, and I see that continue to happen for a while. I think, uh, you know, while the economy has improved somewhat, uh, for dealerships that are heavily relying upon just the whole good side of their business, um, we're still, that's still kind of a weather economy thing. And uh, so, so if the backside, uh, which is what kind of we're working with Jeff on, if the backside of the business is not strong in the parts and service, um, it, as a dealership, the, the whole good part can't carry you if you got some some bad things going on. So I think that's the op one of the opportunities I see there. The, the other opportunity I see, and and I know a lot of the dealers on here are probably uh, compete against the mass merchandisers, but uh, we're we're really finding in dealerships that we're working with, uh, really all across the country, even up into Canada that customers are uh, kind of going back to that the, the, the smaller retailer. Um, we're, I mean, we're seeing a big move on that. Uh, and, and, and I think, again, from, a, from an opportunity standpoint, where maybe you, as a small retailer, you looked uh, with a, you know, kind of an evil eye toward the mass merchandisers because uh, the perception was, again, that they're selling the whole goods at these big discounts that you can't compete against. Um, that they really, and I don't mean any disrespect to anybody, but the people inside of the mass merchandisers absolutely know nothing about what they sell. Uh, I was at a Home Depot here the other day by my home, and they were. I was laughing because there was a a Home Depot salesperson trying to explain to somebody who was sitting on a Cub Garden tractor how it worked. And as I was listening, they didn't have a clue what they were talking about, and, and the customers just being more confused. And I just walked up to the customer and said, "Really, there's a Cub dealer not too far from me here. You ought to just go up there and talk to them." But because the people, they were just getting frustrated. So I think that's a big opportunity, and I think from a retailer standpoint. Uh, Aaron, it's real important for us to to embrace those people coming in. I know they probably didn't buy the equipment from you, uh, but to embrace them coming in and really show them the difference between a mass merchandiser and a retail business and what you can do and the knowledge you have. So those are a couple things to me I think are going to be big over the next few years, and I think it's going to really uh, help propel from a profitability standpoint um, I, the, the, uh, the, the dealers in, into much more profitable positions. Okay. 
then Dave, um, from the software side of things, what changes have you seen to help accommodate some of these opportunities? Well, I think one of the biggest thing is the launch of our, our mobile app. The mobile app actually helps dealers uh, be able to better manage their inventory and work orders and whole goods. And with the help of uh, Bob, we've also made updates to our dashboard so that dealers can actually look at real-time information that helps them make uh, informed decisions in a real-time fashion because they can look at it at any minute of the day and see exactly where they are. Um, one of the other things we did as far as profitability is we added a new feature that allows the dealer to specify a price increase to all parts that are sold on a work order as opposed to those that are sold across the counter. And we also added a feature to uh, set stocking levels based on sales history. And we've added a texting feature to notify customers. So uh, we are staying, I think, pace with technology and the way things are going, and it makes the dealer uh, much better equipped to uh, deal with customers in a real-time uh, environment. Hey, hey, Aaron, can I can I back up just a little bit because Dave, sure. Dave brought up Dave brought up something here that I'd like to have Jeff talk about just briefly. Uh, Ideal has so many wonderful features on it, and you, know, you guys all know that I'm a big fan of Ideal, and I, I love your software and I love your support. Uh, but, but one of the things that uh, Ideal does so well is, is giving the dealership the ability to add some extra profit on the parts that they're selling to their own shop. And when I talk to dealers, dealers struggle with that a little bit. Jeff, I, I know you do. As a matter of fact, you are the most aggressive person that I've ever met on it. But Jeff, would you share a little bit about kind of what, what you're doing by bumping up your parts margin using Ideal, uh, kind of where you started, where you're at now, any kind of negative feedback you've had on that? Would you talk about that just for a moment? Yeah, sure can. Um, we are using that tool so that we bump the parts sold to the shop. We started with a 5% bump. Uh, as I looked at my margins and where I wanted to get to uh, on the part sales, uh, I got a little more aggressive this spring. It's not something I would have done during the slow season, but I actually have that bump at 7% on stuff running through our shop. Um, it, I haven't heard anything negative from a customer on that at this point. Uh, after thinking about it and seeing, you know, what happens just to get the parts out to the shop, um, you know, I think it's well justified. Uh, you know, we're here to make money. We're here to sell parts. We're here to sell service. But in the end, we don't want to gouge the customer, but it does require a little bit more time to get that part into our service department just through the hands that it changes through to get there and on the machine. So we've been using it. I haven't had any negative feedback. I did have one customer last fall notice that an air cleaner was a little bit more when it was on his machine than when he bought it through the front counter. But, you know, it doesn't happen enough to not be able just to deal with the issue, and you can, you know, you can take it kind of on a case-by-case -case basis. But there's just extra dollars there that uh, that we can help to make that service department more profitable. And Jeff, when you do have something like that, you always just blame it on the software, right? I do. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> if I can't blame it on the government, we blame it on the software. <laughs> so it's the software. I don't know what happened. It was the software that went bad. So, right. I, you know, the reason I want to bring it up, uh, Aaron, is because it's just such an incredible opportunity. It's as Jeff said. Jeff moved. We we normally recommend five, but Jeff tested his mark a little bit, and he's got it at seven. And, and, and in, in most dealerships, you know, 30% of the parts you're selling through your parts department are going directly to your shop. You know, so so if you're doing, you know, uh, let's say $200,000 worth of parts sales to your shop, that 7% is $14,000 of net profit. So, uh, again, I, 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 I have a lot of dealers I talk to about it, and I know Jeff's doing it, and Jeff is pretty aggressive at it, but I would just encourage people to uh, – to me, it's one of those opportunities I think that Ideal has created for you that you really want to take advantage of. And we do this in RVs. Uh, we do it in power sports, not just in other power. So I don't have any dealer that I talk to that utilizes Ideal that I don't try to get to do that. So anyway, now I'm off my soapbox, Aaron. No, that's fine. Um, I was going to ask Dave, too, have you seen other uh, users using this feature, and how does that improve their business? 
I think as we implemented it, there were a lot of dealers that were waiting for something like that and very excited. As I implement new dealers, uh, it's, it's a little more difficult to get a brand new dealer to jump on the bandwagon with that. Um, but I think the people that have used it, you know, they started off, I think, a little more conservatively in the 3 to 5% range. Um, but I know the people that are using it are very happy that they went to it and have not really had any negative feedback from customers um, since they started to use it. And like Bob said, it all comes down to net profit because you don't have any more costs associated with using the feature. It's just the feature that generates more revenue. So, Jeff, there was a question that came up. Uh, just uh, people would like to know how long you've been in business. Uh, the business has been here since 1976, and I have owned it. This is going to be our 13th full season here. So we've been through 12 full seasons since we purchased the business. Good. And then, Tess, I saw that you have your parts marked up 10%, so God bless you. So that's a that's a nice number. Again, I think it's something that everybody has to play with a little bit. So, okay, Aaron, back to you. Okay. Uh, so, what is one of the biggest challenges you faced last year, and what did you do to make changes for this season? Probably the biggest challenge we've had uh, is just trying to get our service department to operate in an efficient way. To uh, Try and get customers taken care of a little quicker, and to try and try and get those those extra pieces of equipment that we're not getting when we tell people that we're two and a half weeks out before we can look at something. So um, we've been working with Bob, and we've been making some changes. Uh, Bob's been here. Um, we've made some changes, and we're trying to get that that, that dialed in back there. Uh, it's still a little new to us. We still got some fine tuning to do. But uh, I will say that our that we're getting stuff back out the door quicker than what we were a year ago. Okay, uh, Dave, what have you seen dealers struggling with, and what changes have they made? I would probably echo the same thing that that Jeff just said. Uh, the biggest uh, hurdle that I have to overcome, especially in new implementations, is getting our service department to be profitable. Dealers look at it as a necessary evil, and many dealers are of the opinion of, oh, well, it's just what it is, and they, they really don't know how to make it better. Um, but uh, one of the toughest areas of a dealership to manage effectively is the service department because, as I see it, there's a lack of processes and uh, measurement of key performance indicators. You can't fix what you don't measure. As I had mentioned earlier, we've added several new measurements to our dashboard to assist in uh, the dealer in this area. We've also made enhancements to the software, including adding the embedded time clock, the scheduling calendar, and being able to have multiple jobs on the work order so you can even break down a sort of bigger job into smaller tasks and look at those tasks individually. Uh, ultimately allowing the dealer to really see where they're making money and where they're losing money and be able to react uh, accordingly. Okay. And I know, Bob, you work a lot with dealers in their service process. Do you want to talk a little bit about um, what you do to help them improve efficiency? Sure. Uh, you know, it, it, again, like I said, we, we started working with Jeff, and we've got, you know, as, as in most cases, I think that the, one of the questions is what's the biggest challenges and I would say in all dealerships, the biggest challenges are personnel. Uh, Jeff, Jeff's got wonderful employees. I mean, and he, and he was really blessed. He, he was able to pick up three really key employees this year uh, because Jeff's business, uh, for all practical purposes, has doubled over last year. So Jeff, Jeff's business is under a lot of uh, stress just because of the sheer volume of people that are coming in and this whole goods and this part sales and things like that. So so, so it, it, it really goes back to personnel, and that's some of the things that Jeff and I and Brian are working on, on trying to make some adjustments in personnel. Uh, our our shop, shops are all about process, and, and as I tell everybody, you know, it always starts with process, then it goes to people. Once you get your processes in place, you've got to have the people that will do the process. 
You don't change your process to fit the people. You change the people to fit the process. And that's a little bit of what Jeff and I are going to, uh, we just talked about prior to this webinar starting, but that's some things that we're going to have to look at. Because our process works. Uh, we've never, as I was laughing with Jeff, I've never had a dealership yet that failed at it. Uh, and uh, so it's just a matter of getting them the right people and getting the people to understand how to do it. And, and, and so, so as you used your software, and this goes back to what David was talking about, everything in a dealership is a number. Uh, you know, there's, there's specific numbers that we look at in the service department. We look at tech efficiency and recovery rate and average completion time and absorption. Uh, there's in the in the parts department. You know, we're looking at our average parts sale and our and our uh, the average time it takes a person to move a person from the parts counter back out the door, the transaction time, and in sales we're looking at closing ratios and things like right. that. So so everything in the dealership is a number, and and you've heard me preach it a thousand times. But your software is the heart and soul of all those numbers, and and then, and and as D David was saying, is really utilizing your software and running the reports that you can get out of Ideal that'll show you the picture of everything. So, so when it comes to service, again, uh, if you've heard me speak before, you know, service is all about selling time. And, and to, make, to make a service department work, the first thing you have to do is, is understand that it's time, not dollars, that we sell. And so a technician in our shops is never not on a work order. So in our service department, so from the moment a technician walks into the, the shop that morning there and to the moment they leave, they are always on a work order. We keep track of Every six minutes of time, and every six minutes of time is going to be accounted for in a bill to somebody. It might be billed to a paying customer. It might be billed to a uh, warranty claim. It might be billed even on an internal, but we're going to keep track of that time. And at the end of the day, we're going to run a report out of Ideal, and, and Ideal is going to tell us how good we were at selling the time we bought. So if you have two technicians in your shop, as an example, we know that you have roughly 4,000 hours of time to sell per year. 2,000 hours per technician, and if you're if you're selling only a uh, thousand hours of that, you're only recovering at 50%, and then we need to figure out well what happened to the other thousand hours. Uh, if your if your labor rate's $80 an hour and you should be selling 4,000 hours a time, your shop should be generating uh, roughly $320,000. If one technician each day loses one hour of time and your labor rate's $80 an hour, two technicians have cost you $160 of labor that you didn't sell anybody. Round that down to 150, multiply that by five, that's $750 a week. Uh, that's roughly $3,000 a year. Uh, that's $30,000 of lost revenue in, in, in one year. That's just using 10 months as an average of being busy in the shop. So, so I think, again, what, what David was saying, and I think Jeff would agree with this, is really getting your – you're, you're uh, using your software, getting your measurements right, and then and then running those reports. We run service reports every day at the end of the day. Uh, we run our parts reports on a weekly basis, and then we typically run our sales reports on, a, on an every two-week basis, but I think, again, using that. Then going back to one more challenge here, then I'll get off of this, uh, and I think th this goes back to what Jeff found. Uh, again, it goes back to finding good people, and, and uh, there's a couple of places that we're being really – having some great luck finding people on. One is a, is a website called Indeed, I-N-D-E-E-D.com. Uh, it's free. We've had phenomenal success of finding people for dealers on Indeed. And there's another one called Zip Recruiters that we've used. It's a paid one. It doesn't cost that much to do it, but I've also had some pretty good luck on that. So I think, again, if you've got people that aren't in the right spots or you have bad people, uh, obviously you want to get through your busy season with what you've got. But as you roll out a season, I think, again, it's a matter of, a matter of replacing bad people, finding some good people. And, Jeff, I'll let you speak to it. You, you had three great hires this year. What did that do to your business? Oh, it helped tremendously. There's no way we could have handled uh, what was coming through the door last month without those three. And they were all three pretty green. I mean, <laughs> most of them had only had a couple weeks under their belt before this month hit. But uh, we, just, we did very well with, with those three. Finding them, we did find all three through Indeed, too, Bob. Uh, I've been using Craigslist ahead of that, and the last three or four hires I had off of that just didn't work. Um, and I would recommend, if you're looking for people, that you spend the time. It's, it's free. It's easy. You go on Indeed. You can actually search through resumes in your area. People can f can find you as well just by you posting a job. But even while you're waiting for people to respond to your job post, you can be looking through 
resumes that have already been posted on Indeed. There's, it's a very powerful tool if you're looking for people. Okay, Jeff, and I know you're talking about how to find employees. Um, what practices have you implemented into your business to help keep good employees? And how are they compensated? Well, we have been working on some sort of a comp plan based off of growth, and we just implemented that last month. And the service department's on its own separate comp plan. The parts department's on its own separate comp plan. And we do have a whole goods comp plan that we're kind of fine-tuning and tweaking. Um, that one we don't have dialed in all the way yet. But I sell a lot of the whole goods. And uh, most of the whole goods sales were done by myself. But going forward with our growth, I'm going to have to get somebody in here. So we're going to get that that whole goods comp plan figured out as well. But they're, ba they're paid hourly, and then uh, the comp plans are all based off of growth. Okay. And Dave, how have you seen other dealers um, find and hire good employees, and how is their performance measured in ideal? Um, I think there's a, a variety of ways people hire. Um, unfortunately, I don't get involved in a lot of that as I implement um, dealers. Most of the time, they're not in a situation where they're hiring. But um, I know that some people, if they have in their area a local technical or community college, sometimes the uh, they have a small engine repair um, program and they'll look to those programs to provide employees. As far as compensating employees once they've been hired, I think I've, I've said this to more than one dealer in my travels, is that uh, you want to get out of the mindset of uh, compensating an employee a little bit less than it costs to replace them. Um, we all understand that we have to watch our costs and our margins, but especially when it comes to technicians, those seem to be the hardest to find and keep. And if you get a good one, you need to make sure that your compensation plan is uh, enticing enough that they're not going to have one foot out the door looking where they can make 50 cents more an hour. But using the sales reports, um, including the sales summary report and the detail margin report, Employees can be evaluated and compensated based on their performance. No, it's not always about the volume of sales, but sometimes, uh, more importantly, the quality or gross margins attached to those sales. I've been in dealerships where the top salesperson always seems to have the lowest margin and gives away a lot of items to get sales. Uh, many of our dealerships uh, use a non-inventory product number that we set up as a default it's a product number called SP, which stands for sales promotion. Uh, that allows them to track the volume of inventory that's given away as part of a whole goods sale. It doesn't prevent the salesperson from doing this. It just makes them a little more accountable uh, for what they do. It also controls inventory much better. Um, again, the dashboard has additional graphs and charts to easily view sales and profitability by department and sales reps. Ideal has uh, also a commission report, which can be utilized to calculate the commission based on a rules matrix. Um, uh, the compensation can be based on a percentage of the sale of an item or the percentage of gross profit of an item. So it's pretty simple to set up, and there's five levels for employees and five levels for items. Uh, so if you're not using that now and you're interested in using it, all you have to do is contact uh, one of our support techs and they can help you get those set up or at least show you how to set it up. Okay. And Bob, do you have anything else to add on what other dealers are seeing and how and what solutions are working for them? Yeah, I think, again, you know, a little bit it goes back to what we talked about in the last question about, you know, finding people. And I think, uh, again, probably the most common uh, statement I hear a dealer make is we just can't find good technicians, uh, and I always reply, well, you can always you can find them, you just can't afford them. 
Uh, and, and again, it really goes back, Aaron, because their service department's not profitable. You know, to get a good A-level technician today, say an outdoor power, you know, you're going to pay sixteen, eighteen dollars an hour plus some sort of bonuses based upon performance. And ag or construction, you're going to probably be in that twenty, twenty-two range. You know, in boating, you know, in the marine side of it, you're probably going to be in that sixteen to eighteen range, maybe just a touch higher. Power sports, again, probably about the same. So again, it's a matter of, you know, if you're going to attract good people, you're not going to attract good people for thirteen bucks an hour. It's just not going to happen. Uh, because so, so you got to get your shop right, which goes back to some of the other things we talked about. Then the other piece is, again is making sure that we're not just giving raises based upon people coming in the door. I call them door prizes. You know, I don't give hourly raises to people because they walk in the door one more time uh, another year. So you make everything that every all of your compensation needs to be performance based. Then you have to say, okay, well, if I'm going to make have performance based uh, uh, bonus programs, how do I do it? So it goes back again, like David was saying, you know, you use your software and you look at where your margins of things are at. Shop's a little different. And, again, Jeff and I are working on his comp programs that we talked about a little earlier before the webinar. But but in, in the shop, the, the basic formula is 30% of the money that you generate per hour uh, can be allocated to a technician. So if I have a technician, let's say my posted labor rate is $80 an hour, I could pay a technician who is 100% efficient. Uh, uh, 30% of that or $24 an hour if they were 100% efficient. Now, I'm not going to give them $24 an hour. I'm going to give them some sort of an hourly rate, maybe $16 an hour plus maybe a $2 per billable hour bonus if they're 85 to 100%, uh, uh, maybe a $4 bonus if they're 101 to 125%, and maybe a $6 bonus if they're 126% or up. So, so that, that's my first thing. So I have to say how much could I pay a technician if they were 100% efficient? The second piece of that is, is then 15% of your of that money that you generate has to go to management costs. So if I had a, a a rate of $80 per billable hour, then I have basically uh, $12 per hour I can allocate toward my management costs. So if you've got a service manager, a service writer, uh, or you as an owner are helping manage, $12 of that 80 could go to that. 35% of that would go to departmental costing. So I've got to pay my unemployment workers comp, social security. Uh, all the other stuff that goes with that, my building space rent, my insurance and things like that is a part of that. And then I would expect 20% of that money that you generate to go back to your pocket as net profit. So that's kind of the magic numbers there. And, again, as David said, you can pull that out of your business management software. Jeff was talking about on the parts side, Aaron, about compensating the parts people, and, and we're working on that with Jeff. Our, our philosophy is is that we give them a bonus based upon increased sales from from month to date. So in – April, as an example of 2014, if, if Jeff's folks did $50,000 of part sales and this year they did $60,000 worth of part sales, there's a $10,000 increase in sales, we would then do a calculation. And again, you can pull it right out of ideal, but we would look at what the gross profit margin was on those sales. And if it's 40%, uh, then we would take 40% of that $10,000. That would give us $4,000 of net profit or gross profit actually net profit because our, our other costs are coming out of the money that we're not bonusing on. So I'd have $4,000 there I could use as a bonus. We would take 30% of that or $1,200, and I would bonus that $1,200 to my parts people with my manager getting 50% of it and my parts people getting and dividing equal the other 50. And then we always do in the in the sales side of it for compensation. Uh, it depends a little bit upon it, but Jeff and I are also going to be working on this as he hires Normally, we'll do a $500 per week base, and then in, in the outdoor power side, we might do 15% of the net profit. If it's in ag, construction equipment, or in boats, we typically do 10% of the net profit. So it's a base of, say, $500 a week, and then and then uh, either a 10 or a 15% uh, net profit, depending upon on what you're selling. So, you know, to keep good people, you have to pay good people well, and, and, and I think um, – Having good, strong compensation programs that are simple, use ideal because all the information is there. So everything is performance based, and then you can uh, you can you can do uh, you can do your bonuses and things based upon that. But I think to me that's the big piece: is find good people, pay them very well, treat them well, and they will stay with you. Okay. We've already talked quite a bit about measurement, but I wanted to ask Jeff. Jeff, you've experienced tremendous growth throughout your entire dealership. Can you talk just a little bit about how you've gotten to where you're at now, um, how ideals help manage your 
growth and what advice you have for other dealers looking to manage their growth? Yeah, I sure can. Um, some of it I don't know that I've been managing. I've just been hurt trying to <laughs> trying to uh, keep up with it. At, at times it's a little overwhelming because it doesn't feel like we are managing. We are just putting out fires at times with growth that fast. It's just really hard to react. And I thought we had uh, enough people hired and enough things in place that we could handle all of what was coming. Some of it was the weather. Last year we had, you know, perfect rains here in Iowa, and the grass was green from April through, people were cutting grass April through November. It was spring all over again last fall. I think part of it, people were tired of using their old equipment after last year, and it set us up for um, a good start to the season. Uh, I have been using Ideal to help me have the right amount of inventory on hand. Um, before Ideal, I did not use an inventory management uh, part of our software for our whole goods. I've actually set mins and maxes on a lot of our whole good pieces so that I'm just not shooting from the hip and having to walk around and look and see what are we low on, what do we need. Uh, I set the mins and maxes, and I run an order recommendation for our whole goods so that every Saturday I get an order together and try and get that taken care of because Mondays, and I'm sure it's this way for the other dealers, it's probably the craziest day of the week. Everything breaks on Saturday afternoon and Sunday. Uh, people are tired of their old mower um, and ready for a new mower a lot of times on Mondays. So I've been using the whole goods order recommendation to help me have the right amount of inventory on hand. Uh, same thing with the parts. Our part sales are up too. So uh, we've always used the, the uh, men's and maxes. We've just had to fine-tune them, and with the uh, with the reporting that we have and with being able to track the activity right on the purchase orders as we're ordering, we can fine-tune that. We can, we can add or decrease the amount that we want to stock really quick as we're putting together a purchase order. So with those features, uh, it's helped me have the right amount of inventory on hand so we had the products to sell to our customers. Okay, and Dave, do you have anything more to add, too, on how um, to utilize Ideal to help measure and manage growth in your business? Again, I think I'd get back to uh, the different types of reports that are available. Um, they're, really, they're really helpful, and if you watch them and read them, some people print them and they go in a stack because they think they need to print them, but they don't really look at them and, and analyze them. There's a wealth of information in there, and there's so many different variables you can use, uh, including uh, one that comes to mind is the sales summary by volume, where I could say, okay, like the system to tell me my top 100 items that I'm selling both in quantities and or in dollars. And it also shows the gross profit margin. And what I tell dealers is, look, if you're going to get this pricing thing right, it better be on the top 100 items because the rest doesn't matter a whole lot. Okay. Uh, Bob, do you have anything else to add in regards to um, once you have all those numbers in front of you, how do you successfully manage that growth? Well, I, I have David's cell phone number, so I just call David, and he gives me advice on how to do that. So, no. I, you know, I, I think, again, I, I would encourage, you know, the, the again, one of the things I love with Ideal is the dashboard. And I don't think enough people utilize the dashboard because the dashboard gives you all this incredible information that you can look at. It's like, you know, I used to be a pilot, and you sit in your airplane, and you're watching your gauges all the time. It tells you everything that's going on. And, and so you don't, you're not using your gut feeling. So I think I would encourage people to, to really uh, embrace the dashboards and utilize those for each thing. The other, the other piece I would say, again, and, and uh, 
David and I sat down here, uh, it was probably about last, before Christmas of last year, and we put together a series of, of um, reports that, that we would normally use, and we have those if you want to go to our, our website and up to our toolbox there, you can just pull those up. Uh, but but it's, there's uh, there's about 20 reports there that if I come into a dealership, if I have these 20 reports, everything I need to know about your dealership I know. And so I would encourage you to, to get in and, and pull those reports up and look at them. The other, and it kind of goes back to David, I agree, you know, in your parts department, you, you can you can make so much money just by tweaking. And, and as David was talking about, if you run your report on your part sales by volume, uh, you've got those 100 parts there. And, and there's a few of them that are going to be price sensitive. So you want to make sure that you're really competitive on maybe, you know, three or four items, and you kind of put them up on your parts counter, and you tell people, check out our prices. But, but there's a lot of parts that people don't know what the price should be on, and that's where I really encourage our dealers to go in and tweak that up a little bit. Uh, you know, if you're, again, if you're doing $300,000, $500,000, $800,000 worth of part sales, you know, 1% tweak is three, four, ten thousand dollars $10,000. And, and, you, and you have the ability to do that so easily and ideal. So I would encourage you to, you know, to, to go back in what David's talking about there. Go back in there and look at your margins. And like I say, you, you know what items are going to be price sensitive. You're going to have uh, maybe a few oil filters, one or two, that's really price sensitive, or you know, it could be a spark plug, it could be anything. You'll have to kind of know that from your own dealership. But, but so, so bring those down to list price or just a touch below list, and brag about the fact that you got great prices on those two or three items. Uh, and, and, and then people, because that, that's all they know, that they'll sit there. It's like McDonald's or a, it's like a Walmart. You know, they know what women know the price of, and so they price that right, and they know what women don't know the price of. Or men, in that example, and, and they and they price that high, and they make up that they make up that difference. So, utilizing ideal from that standpoint, from the reporting standpoint, to really tweak your tweak your margins out on your parts. There's just so much money that you can you can pick up there. So, you know, to me, it's the, like David said, the reports are there. You just have to go in, and then, you know, as an owner, you've got to quit working so hard to be an employee, and you've got to get focused a little bit more on being an owner and, and looking at that 30,000-foot level, which is what the ideal reports give you. You know, you can see everything that's going on in your business. If you're using ideal properly, there's nothing that's happening in your business that ideal doesn't track for you. And then you just have to know what reports to look at, and then what's a good baseline. You know, what you know, we, we, know what, we know what a good baseline is in the shop and what a good baseline is in parts, and we know – what a good baseline is in sales. So know what the baseline is. Look at what your software, what Ideal tells you where you're at. And if you're at the baseline or below it, you know, work on using the software again and saying, okay, well, how do I move that up? How do I improve that? So, again, I think Ideal's got everything you need there. You just got to you gotta quit working so hard as an employee. And you got to start thinking a little bit more like an owner and use your software as a, uh, as a, as a tool to help you really improve your profitability. I'd like to add a little bit to that if I could. Uh, that sales summary, I like to run that on a daily basis, especially this time of the year. For you dealers out there, I would encourage you to do so. You can catch a lot of your pricing. If something's off with your parts, you want to catch it now. You don't want to catch it at the end of the season or in season. We want to catch it now so we can get that profit right now. Um, it's As far as fine-tuning, getting your margins where you would like them, it, it takes a little bit of time. I have been looking at mine for probably the last eight months, and I think I'm done fine-tuning for now. I think we got them where we like. But as you run that uh, sales summary, if you run that daily, you can see each day by your manufacturer where your parts are landing. And if there's something that's off, you can then do another report so you can pull up the parts that you sold that day through that manufacturer, and you can see where that's coming from. Did somebody discount it, or are we just not adding enough to get to where we want to go? And it takes several days of this to get things dialed into where you want to, but that I've spent the last eight months trying to get it where, I, where it is now just so we're prepared for this season so that we can, we can hit our mark. The dashboard is also a great tool, and I do look at that daily. But to get in, to dive in and get deeper, you really need to run that, that sales summary by volume and, and try and do it daily. If, you're not, if your margins aren't where you want them, if you don't know where they're at, run it daily so that you're getting a handle on that. Okay, that's great advice. Okay, for our last topic of the 
today, uh, many dealers are looking to expand into additional locations. Jeff, what do you think a dealer should consider before opening a second location, and what do you see as both the upside and the downside of taking on a second store? Well, I guess the upside is if you've got things working well at one, you should be able to duplicate that at another store, and your profitability should be similar as far as uh, things to consider before going before I would do that, I would want to make sure that I have every part of this dealership running as smooth as it needs to. I, you know, I think a lot of dealers look at the fact that they would like to have another store, but they still can't get their service department figured out. So now we've got two service departments that aren't profitable. And so now we've got the, all this extra risk. We've got these, this this extra debt we've taken on, and we really haven't fine-tuned it at our first location. And I would consider a second location at some point, but I think we've got some things to work through here. I think we're doing really well in a couple of our departments, but we definitely have some work to do in the service end of it. And before I, before I go too much further with uh, looking into that, we – We've got to get our processes down here. Then we're gonna. Then we could try and duplicate that somewhere else. Okay, uh, Bob. What are you seeing with other dealerships? What advice would you have for those looking to expand? Well, I, I I've got to agree wholeheartedly with Jeff. There's no need of looking at a second location until you got all your processes in place in your first one because you're just you're 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 uh, headed for disaster. Uh, so the first thing is just making sure that, that your service departments, all the processes are in place there, and the same thing in parts and the same thing in sales. So getting the processes in place um, is, is key to it. It's, it's like a McDonald's. It make, McDonald's has 30,000 locations because uh, they all make French fries and hamburgers the exact same way, and so you can, you can duplicate the processes. The other thing that I see, and we have a lot of our dealers that have multiple locations, and I think if there's a common thread I see through all of them, and I think they would all tell you exactly the same thing, is if you're going to open your second, your second one will be the most complex one that you ever open. It, 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 will, it will not be as tough as your first store, but it will be about as tough as your first store. The third one and the fourth one, and I've got a dealer right now, it's not a power, that's got 11. Uh, and, and I think he would tell you that, that after you get past the third one, it becomes easier because now all your processes are in place. But I think they would all tell you that if they made a mistake, most of them, opened up their second location and put in a manager in that location, and I think that is a fatal mistake uh, because a, first, a second location needs an, owner, an owner's presence there. Train somebody up in your, in your first location and let them manage your first location because all they have to do is manage the processes, uh, the, and the processes then will manage the people. The second location still needs a lot of, uh, of ownership decisions that take place. And, and you'll lose so much money so fast if you have a manager in there because they will not think like an owner thinks. I don't care how well they're trained. Uh, people spend your money better than they spend their money. Uh, the government would be a good example of that. So, so I would say, again, uh, don't – if you're going to open a second location, only open it if you're willing yourself personally as an owner to go into that second location and run it and then put somebody in that first location. I think once you get your second one going, your processes get really tuned in, and at that point, you can stay at the second one, and then you can you can start growing a manager out of your first location to take into your third one. So, those are some things I think that I would say pretty pretty confidently that any of the dealers that I have that have multiple locations now would agree with me on. Okay, and Dave, from the software side of things, uh, what do dealers have to look out for in regards to their software system and expanding to other locations? Um, as the software obviously has, has to be able to run multiple locations, and they have to have a good inventory management system and sales reporting system capable of showing each location separately while showing the entire entity put together. Uh, the accounting features have to allow for individual income statements so that each location can be judged as to its own individual net profitability. On the sales report, sales side of things, you can manage the locations and look at 
gross profitability. Uh, but if you really want to look at net profitability, you really need a good working general ledger that can break down those locations and report and provide individual income statements based on each location. And I would echo what um, both Bob and, and Jeff said. Uh, I've worked with a lot of dealerships over the last 20 years that have expanded to more than one location. Some of them have done well, and some of them had failed quickly. And the ones that failed quickly are the ones where the owner is not intimately involved with a second location. Uh, and the only way that, the, that they can be intimately involved in the second location is to have people in place at the primary location that are capable of running that location flawlessly without the presence of the owner. So um, that's really, I think, the key. One, one of the questions that, that came up was uh, opening on, open on Sunday. Uh, Jeff, I, I don't, I have, a, I think, a couple of dealers. It's more on the compact tractor side that are open on Sundays. Jeff, what are your thoughts on, on being open on Sunday? What kind of impact would it have? And, and uh, what are your thoughts on that? Well, Sundays is not an option to me. Being open on Sundays is not an option on, for us, for my wife and I. We have made that decision and had that discussion a long time ago. Um, some of it is our beliefs. That, that is the day that, uh, that we want our employees and we want to be with our families. And our profitability, if it is affected by that, you know, I guess our thoughts are um, we have six other days of the week. If we can't be profitable then, then we probably should be in a different business. So Sunday is not an option for us. I know some of these manufacturers want to stick these products in these hardware stores and these box stores because they're open on Sunday. Um, but it's just it's just not an option for me and my family. Yeah, and, and I I would agree. Uh, you know, Jeff, I think again, uh, being open on Saturday for the most part is going to uh, to get you the bulk of the customers you're trying to do. Uh, at some point, everybody has to have a life. It's different if you're in a mass merchandise and you've got, you know, 100 people there that are part-time and they're all working different hours. That's just not the uh, that's not the case in a small uh, dealership. Uh, it just doesn't work that way. Now, if you're on the marine side, that might be just a little bit different. You might have a service tech in there to help people out. But, uh, but I would say for the most part, if you can't make enough money six days a week, then you're probably doing something wrong in your business. So, uh, David, any thoughts on that? No, we have uh, many dealerships. Uh, most of our commercial dealerships uh, that primarily uh, do commercial business, they're open Monday through Friday, and their their thought process is, look, if they can't get it Monday through Friday, 7 to 5, they don't need it until Monday. Yeah, and, and again, it might be a little different. I think, again, uh, most of my outdoor power dealers are open. Uh, kind of uh, it, during season, maybe eight to two or something like that. But I think that that catches a lot of it. You know, you're, there's there's plenty of opportunity out there. Uh, another question that came up, Jeff, and, and I'll just run this by you. Uh, a question came up about having lost leaders. You know, from a pricing standpoint, do you do anything like that in your store? Uh, you know, to kind of um, uh, have lost leaders as a part of your pricing strategy. I don't do it for parts. You know, there's always that whole good piece of equipment that the manufacturer advertises for 179 or 159 that us dealers make $20 on before we get it out of a box. You know, I, I guess I consider that kind of the loss leaders. That's what they're running in the ads, them, them entry-level price points. Steel does it. Uh, Husqvarna does it. You know, those are already out there. I don't, I don't have, you know, mower blades or oil filters or anything like that. We just don't have enough different variety of stuff to sell to try and give stuff away to get people in our door. Once in a great while, we might run some special promotion. We'll do things where we'll, for our service department, if they'll service them early, we'll, we'll give free pickup and delivery um, and, and to keep the guys busy. We'll give away stuff like that, but we really don't, we really don't advertise uh, some sort of a part 
or once in a while we'll run a special promotion, you know, one day we'll give a chain with a saw, something like that, but but not on a regular basis. Good. And then, uh, Jeff, one more question that came up for you. Uh, what, what are you finding that's working well for you from a marketing standpoint? Well, um, it's a, <laughs> that is really tricky. Uh, I think the digital is where we need to be focused more as dealers. I think the, the showing up on Google, if somebody's searching lawnmowers in your area, you need to be, you need to be coming up on that first page. Uh, it's really hard. It's really easy to throw our money at lots of different medias. You can throw it at radio, TV, the paper, and they'll take a lot of your money. Um, but a lot, you know, a lot of the things that you can do these days are free from your Facebook page to um, um, other social medias that are out there. Um, our websites are very important. A lot of our marketing dollars need to be spent on having a website that is that promotes what we're doing, gets people there from that Google search. I spend a little bit of money on the radio. I didn't spend a bunch, but I spent a couple thousand dollars on the radio last month with on talk radio. I like talk radio better because I think people are listening better to what's going on. I put a little bit of money into the paper. I only do like back pages, and if I do it, it's typically – um, and something that's local that people are going to look at because a lot of our big papers anymore, they're, they're just not picking up the actual paper itself. Uh, I do some of the little free shoppers that people can get um, because, again, I think people are looking through there, looking for deals. It's pretty cheap advertising. Um, but you really got to watch at where you're putting your money. I think the digital, the online stuff, I think is really the best bank for our buck. And, and Jeff, one more because again, I've, I've been up there. You you invested uh, quite a bit of money in a digital sign outside of your store. Uh, now again, you've got a pretty high traffic count where you're at there. But but how has that worked for you? Well, that sign this this will be our third season with that sign, and it's a it's a digital LED sign. It's got 24 square foot of of basically a video board. You can run lifelike videos on it. The city would not like me to do that now. They <laughs> kind of changed the rules on us. But this sign, you can put, you know, pretty much whatever your imagination can can come up with on there. Uh, I think it does grab the some of attention. I don't think we've seen the benefits of it the first two years because we had the two driest years on the the. I've ever seen since I've been here, and I think there are a couple of the driest years in the last 20 years back to back uh, ahead of last season. And so we didn't initially see the results, but I do think we've been dropping, uh, having messages on there. We've been planting seeds for as people drive by to work. We do have a very high traffic count here. And the other thing I would encourage the dealers to do, if, if you can have equipment out in front of your store and you've got people driving by, that's one of the biggest things that gets people in here to look at mowers. They know we're in the mower business when they drive by and there's 45 mowers outside. It's a big task to get them in and out every day, but when they drive by, they know we're in the mower business. And I would have to agree, Jeff, it takes a lot of, to move your equipment in and out, but when you drive by your store down there, there is no doubt that you're in the you're in the outdoor power business. Uh, just real quickly, uh, there was a question that came up where Jeff's located. Jeff is located in Des Moines, Iowa, uh, just uh, just kind of right in the Des Moines area. Uh, one more quick question, Jeff, if you don't mind. What, what's, what did your, your digital sign cost, you know, size-wise, and what would a dealer be looking at to invest in something like that? The whole sign, poll... And the digital part, and then there's another part up top that is the rate. Uh, how, how would you explain that? Basically, it's it's more like what a regular sign would be. Um, we spent about thirty-eight thousand dollars. It was a huge expense. Uh, I basically looked at it from a, the standpoint of if we took a five-year note on it, and we used marketing dollars on that, we would decrease our marketing budget. It used to be you throw your money in the paper. 12, 13 years ago, I could run an ad in the paper, and 10 people would walk in with the paper, and you knew it was working. It doesn't happen anymore. It just doesn't work that way. So we took some of our marketing dollars, we put it towards that sign, and that's how we justified that expense. 
I, I do think that um, I do think it's working for us. I think that again, we can put messages up there. We can put specials there. They know what all the different brands we have. A lot of people thought we only had parts for Steel and Cup Cadet before we took on our other lines. Well, now they know every line we have because we have those different manufacturers flashing at them as they're driving by. And I think just to go back to what Jeff said, you know, we, we encourage dealers. I, I really love the, the uh, digital side. Jeff's got a, a great sign up there. And, again, the city is, gives them a little bit of a hassle on it. And I know everybody here, your counties and your cities, have, have different uh, uh, variances on those signs. But I would encourage you to look at them. As Jeff said, they basically, you know, said, look, over five years, we're going to take a, a percentage of our marketing money that we're using anyway that may or may not be working for us. And in five years, we'll have to sign paid for it, and then we own it forever and ever and ever. So, uh, so you know, my, I always encourage dealers to, to look at investing, taking 25% of their marketing funds uh, for the next five years and investing that in one of those digital signs if, if your city or your county uh, will let you do it. I think they're a powerful tool, and then once you, once you pay for it, you own it, and, 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 and it's, it's that way there. So, uh, David, any other thoughts or questions, and I'll wrap it up here. I think uh, I think you've covered most of what I was going to say, so what I would say would be redundant. So I think uh, you can just wrap it up. Good. All right, Jeff. Uh, and, again, I'm, I don't think Aaron's back on here, but so I'll go ahead and wrap it up. Jeff, thanks so much. It's a pleasure working with you. And, David, as always, uh, you are a huge benefit to my organization, anyway, with that cell phone number there. So thank everybody also. Katina, thank you for having us, and thank everybody for attending. I know that this will be uh, – this has been recorded, and I know you'll be able to uh, get a link for it. So if you have some other people that weren't able to uh, be a part of this webinar, uh, you'll be getting a link to that so that you can listen to it later on. And then if you have some questions on comp programs and things like this, we have those uh, on our in our dealer toolbox. It's just Bob. Uh, com, and I think there's some tools there that you'll find in our free toolbox that will help you do that along with uh, uh, some uh, some different ads and things like that that you can run on Indeed and in uh, ZipRecruiter. So if you have some questions on that, just shoot over to our website. And uh, like I said, there's a free toolbox there, and I think some of those things are in that. Uh, thanks uh, again, Ideal, for hosting this webinar. Everybody have a wonderful afternoon.